unfiltered, uncensored, and unapologetic. This is the Retail War Zone Podcast. Good evening. So we're going to hit the ground running here. So I hope nobody's late. Uh, first of all, everybody keep blame tag in your thoughts, seeing how he is in the middle of that mess in Florida right now. And I know he lost power permanently there for just a little bit ago. So uh, make sure him and his wife and cats are doing okay. So tonight, I am extremely thrilled to have Miss Shauna Potter here this evening. She is the lead vocalist for the band War on Women. And she is also an author. Uh, her book is Makes Space, Making Spaces Safer. Her website is shaunapotter.com. Uh, in the description of the video, all her links and all her band links will be there uh, along with a link to purchase the book. So what I'd like to do is, Shauna, if you take a second, tell us a little bit about yourself, and then we will go from there. Sure. Hi. Thank you so much, Steve, for having me. Um, yeah. I mean, that sums it up. I'm a, I'm a punk singer. I yell a lot. <laughs> I'm angry about stuff a lot. Um, luckily, I have an outlet for it. And then, uh, yeah, I wrote a book called Making Spaces Safer, which is just about my experience in creating and implementing a program for any space, really, to anticipate uh, identity-based harassment and to um, uh, deal with it when it comes comes up in a way that's actually helpful for anyone experiencing it. So it's the proactive stuff you can do. And then what do you do in the moment? Um, and that's, that's my big thing. Uh, just making sure everyone's prepared uh, for when someone decides to be a jerk, mm -hmm. <laughs> everyone knows what to do so that everyone can have a good time. That's, that's what I care about. Uh, I also have a podcast called, but her lyrics um, and that we have two seasons out right now. So look that up in all the normal places uh, and a Patreon, if anyone wants to support all my all my endeavors, uh, you can support me there. Just slash Shauna Potter. Awesome. So talking about support and things like that, there were a lot of things I wanted to kind of touch base with you on because I've been wanting to have a musician on for a for quite a while since I've really started this thing. My first love has always yeah. been music. And I think there are some interesting stories to tell about the different things that professional musicians have to go through. And the first thing I really want to touch on is the mental health status of you guys that were in the industry or are in the industry when everything shut down during the pandemic. I mean, what kind of things did you have to do to supplement? Because, you know, anybody that knows anything about the business, especially, you know, unless you're some major label act, I mean, your survival is based on touring and merch, you know, so kind of tell us a little bit what the band went through and kind of how y'all dealt with that. Well, it was interesting at the beginning, right? Because at first we're like, oh, well, maybe it's not that big a deal. Or And then it was, well, let's lock down for a couple of weeks. And then, oh, this is still going on. And, uh, you know, so there were like different stages of, um, well, this might not last too long. And then we'll be right back out at it. And that's fine. And then it just kept going. And so I think for some people, it was instantly just mentally really tough. And for me, I felt like I had some resilience that I could... I was okay for like the first year and then just the continuation, you know, even up till today, I feel like my, my resilience is just depleted and, and everything in life is a little bit harder. But I mean, when the lockdown was announced, we had a tour cancel. We were scheduled to go on tour with Bad Religion and Alkaline Trio. And eventually they got rescheduled. We did it this past fall, but, um, that was really tough because that felt like a huge opportunity and a way for us to get in front of a bunch of new people and to not, not be able to do that. That was really rough. So then we uh, were all, we were also in the middle of making a record. And then at some point we were like, okay, well the pandemic's still going on. Like what do we do with this album? Do we release it now? Do we sit on it? Do we work on something else? Um, and just, total like I would call friends and bands and say what did you do what are you doing and but basically everyone was just fumbling and doing their best and it was all uncharted territory and I don't know that I don't know that anyone had a <laughs> had a really successful time um unless 
they really got up on their online merch game or they're a solo artist or could pivot to become kind of a solo performing artist and that they, you know, they thrived on those live streams that were happening. Um, War on Women is not a band <laughs> that sounds great acoustic <laughs> <laughs> or in a live stream. Uh, that's not our thing. And so that wasn't really like an opportunity for us. Um, we also didn't have money or resources to to go to our favorite local club and get an engineer and have them have a videographer film it from different angles and try to make like a really cool live stream. Like we don't we don't have that kind of money either. So um, we just I think we all like as individuals went into survival mode. How do we make how do we make money? Because the band's not going to. So how how do we as individuals make money? And it was, I know I was applying for grants. I was applying for unemployment as soon as that could that was an option. Um, I felt like I had about a week, just a week of, oh let's you know maybe I'll cook dinner at home tonight. <laughs> like oh I've got some oh I don't have to do anything. Like I did all my chores, did all the laundry, clean the clean the apartment, you know, did all that stuff. Relaxed for a week, and then it was like. Uh, let's look at my bank account. How am I going to get through this? So did you have something to fall back on? Um, I was, uh, I was working, my regular job was working at Big Crunch Amp Repair, which I started with um, Brooks Harlan, who also plays guitar in War and Women. So we, we fix amps for a living and he designs and builds them. Um, so we had been doing that for a decade or so. Um, and it was around that time that I had already decided I want to try to do more of the public speaking, the trainings, the workshops, the safer space stuff, the bystander intervention talks. Like I was just really enjoying doing that, meeting new people, going to new places. Um, and, uh, so I was gonna, I was gonna stop working at Big Crunch and I was gonna start doing that pandemic. Mm. Couldn't go anywhere. Couldn't do anything. So, um, Brooks kept working at Big Crunch um, and he was able to survive. Like there's just enough work for one person that it made sense. Um, and I, I luckily got a, a grant to, to do something that's sort of under my umbrella of safety that just saved my fucking ass. It just, it totally saved me. And without that, I'm not sure what would have happened. Now, did, were you guys eligible for the, the PUA when that finally kicked in? As gig workers? Um, yeah, like, yes, yes. But then in Maryland, it went away. Oh, wow. So it's like I got it. I, I certainly got it for a while. I It's not an option anymore. Um, it, it became, I mean, that's its own job, right? Applying for grants, applying mm -hmm. for unemployment, keeping up with all the rules, getting all the things that you need to do and re reenlisting, reinstating, like that is a job. Um, so I spent a lot of time doing doing all of that and it just became too difficult at some point to like try to get unemployment anymore it kind of kicked me off uh after a while and i was like i can't i can't <laughs> well at least you didn't go back to retail right you know <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> that is one thing you have a musician but you also have someone that worked a lot of retail that was my first job, second job, third job, you know. Um, so I definitely have some experience in retail and some light food service, like cafe, coffee shop kind of stuff. Nice. All right. So we're going to pivot a little bit here, still music industry based. And this is something that I had a very limited exposure to the business. Uh, I did studio work for a little while when I lived in Atlanta. By the way, you're going to be playing a show on my wedding anniversary on October 31st oh at the Masquerade. Well, are you going to be there? What better way to celebrate? No, I'm going to be in South Carolina <laughs> working at a grocery store. But anyway, um, so um, as far as like, you know, my experience with the industry and I did a lot, you know, that was a little bit more, even though I'm kind of like a metal guy or whatnot, I, I did a lot kind of in the R&B hip hop kind of vein, you know, the session stuff. And it wasn't a lot it, of work there. Yeah. yeah. It, but, it, but it wasn't a lot, but you know, I learned a lot about like how the business kind of operated as far as how it cherry picked talent. And the one thing I wanted to ask you about is it's kind of two part. 
firstly, the overall treatment of women in the music industry. And do you see it getting better? And the second part is the thoughts of women being, you know, overly sexualized as a product versus talent. It's meaning you could have a great singer, a great musician, but they don't have that marketable look and they just kind of get pushed to mm-hmm. the side. But they'll get some Barbie doll up there who they'll auto tune to death, you know, put her in mm-hmm. skimpy clothes and put her on TV and send her out there. So your yeah. thoughts on that, too. Um, we don't have a long enough time period (laughs) for me to give you all my thoughts. Okay. You're asking big (laughs) questions, but, um, you know, I, the words of, uh, Gloria Steinem have always resonated with me at some point in the past. Obviously she was asked about, um, that time when like Miley Cyrus was like going full on Mm anti-Disney basically and just making sure everyone knew she's over 18 she's a grown-up she can do what she wants uh she's really asserting herself as a grown person um and was you know dancing around and next to nothing at vmas um someone asked him about that which i don't even know why you would bother asking someone so amazing and so um important in feminist history (laughs) about miley cyrus but Uh, they were like, what do you think about that? And she said, you know, it's hard to be mad at someone, I'm paraphrasing, but it's hard to be mad at someone or blame someone for playing the only game they know. Mm -hmm. Like someone else set up the rules. And if you, and you look at the board and you're like, well, I want to get, I want to get to the end. I want to get to the finish line and you can do it this way or this way. You might make some choices that you wouldn't make if those parameters weren't already in place by, you know, put there by someone else. So that has always given me a a bit of um, empathy for, for people that are just doing their best because they just want to perform. So fine. You want me to put on next to nothing? Who cares? I'll do it. You know, Um, because people are still passionate about playing music, whether we like that music or not, Mm -hmm. you know, like performing is an art. Uh, and you know, as a former theater kid too, I'm just like performing is an art. So it's, it's, it's hard to be mad at folks who participate in it. It's, it's more like I'm mad that society has gotten to the point where we're, we don't, uh, analyze it or question it or give equal opportunity to folks, you know, but that's also why it's so inspiring to see someone like Billie Eilish who's like wearing a baggy Mm t-shirt and shorts because she's like yeah but this is comfortable you know and like i actually think that that is uh a really big deal uh that she got popular and uh for young women like like i think she's a great person for young women to look up to to say like you can you can have great music a great voice you can uh get big get popular and still uh dress comfortable that's okay yeah, but she That sort of answers your question. I mean, but basically, are things better for women? Yes and no. I think capitalism ruins everything around me. True, <laughs> so it, true, true. It's like capitalism consistently tries to make things worse, no matter what advances we get. Um, and, and whether that's in, you know, the laws or just societal, you know, progression, whatever. And then capitalism comes in and it's like, but how are we going to make money? Right. So... It's a, it's a tough one. Um, so when I want to get into the activism part now. Okay. Okay. Um, so I did see that, that Hollowback is now right to be correct. Yeah. Um, and the first question I have is, you know, with the, the making spaces safer, what was the impetus of it being, so based around arenas, you know, and, and venues and the, and, and I'm guessing it kind of goes along with this. I, it, these stats are really hard to find because, because I looked and, and there's not a lot of publicly available numbers, but from a BBC article in 2018, it said 43% of all females under 40 years old have faced unwanted sexual behaviors at concerts. Um, overall, 22% have faced assault or harassment yet only 2% reported it to authorities. Uh, Also, the University of Nevada, Las Vegas, did a um, 
study in 2018 saying that 92% of women surveyed reported some type of harassment it shows. 62% were verbal, 55% were groped, and 3% were raped. Now ask me a question. Well, (laughs) is that kind of behavior the impetus for kind of your passion for talking to people that run venues and, and, you know, inclusivity and, and making sure that people know the right things to do to, you know, disarm a situation. I think my concentration on venues and I actually don't deal with arenas that often. It's, it's more like small and mid size like independent venues where they don't have to answer to a corporate over lowered. They can just make decisions for themselves. Right. Um, that makes it easier to make change happen. Um, my, but my impetus to work with venues, I think is just a perfect marriage of my activism and anti-street harassment work. And then just, being someone that has played and gone to venues since I was 12 years old, you know, like I've been going to shows and playing shows for a very, very long time. And so it's just my lived experience of like, well, here's a place where people gather and it's dark and there's alcohol. um, But there's so much more that I think people could be doing. Uh, What if they just let me tell them? What if I just write a book about it? You know, (laughs) like, what if I just share this information? This is not information that should be kept secret. Uh, It's meant to be shared. But my, uh, for anyone wondering the, why you mentioned Hollaback at the top of this question, uh, Hollaback is where I got my start in activism. I started the Baltimore chapter of Hollaback um, over 10 years ago. And uh, eventually I bowed out and recently Hollaback has changed its format. Um, They changed their name to Right to Be. And then they actually no longer have like individual chapters. Um, It's just the main chapter in New York City. So I think they're kind of, um, they change it up a little bit and that's kind of recent. So everyone can go to, you know, their website, Right to Be dot something pride.org <laughs> and it's so new that i don't know sorry sorry Hollaback. sorry right to me um but they do really great work and they because of the grants they get from uh big corporations they're able to give a lot of free trainings a lot of free virtual trainings and so uh i definitely recommend people check those out if nothing else you can learn a lot about how to respond to harassment uh from them for free um, you can also buy my book, which is 15 bucks or hire me to, to lead a, a tailored training to your group or your venue. Speaking of the training, uh, how was your overall experience doing that at Warped? Oh, um, you know, uh, war on women is not as famous <laughs> as most of the other bands playing warp tour, uh, any year of warp tours ex- existence. Um, so I think that uh, I didn't have the interest I would have liked because we weren't people's favorite band. I think, you know, you're going there. It's like one day. There's a packed schedule, a ton of bands. And then your favorite band is doing like a Q&A, like a private Q&A for like only like a few people. You're going you're gonna to pay to see them. You're not going to pay me to tell you how to do bystander intervention or how to create a safer venue. Um, so of course I, I did, I did, I did many, uh, I didn't do it every day, but I did many, um, and usually smaller crowds. Um, but obviously the people that came were so invested in safer spaces and wanted to know what they could do. Um, and I really was prepared and I'm always prepared to, to talk to people, whether they're on stage they're a touring band and they want to know what to do. If they, if they're at a venue, they work at the venue, they're the boss or just a worker bee, you know? Um, but most everyone that I was talking to at Warp Tour was, they say, no, I just go to shows. I just like music. And so I was able to keep it really simple and just teach them the five D's of bystander intervention. Um, and the, the easiest go-to of the five D's is the delayed method. And that just means that after when something happens, you just check in on the person. Like, hey, Steve, Steve, I saw that. That looked kind of rough. Are you okay? Just ask someone if they're okay. That's the, that's the least we can do. Yeah, because the five Ds are distract, delegate, document, delay, and direct. Correct. 
You've done your homework. Yes, ma'am, I did. <laughs> I, I, I really, but I also liked the, the conversation that you had um, in one of your interviews about the, the fight or flight versus the phoning. Yes. I, yes. I think that's um, crucial. Yeah. You know, I think that's hard for us to wrap our head around sometimes, um, you know, because people wonder, well, if someone is uh, touching you and you don't want them to, or someone says something rude to you, uh, like really rude, really rude, like not repeat it here, or rude. And just casually, men will just say shit to you. It's nuts, right? Um, and obviously every other marginalized group deals with uh, deals with, with things too. Uh, but just from my experience, men will just say the, the nastiest stuff to you um, when they think no one else is watching or will do anything or there won't be any consequences. And people will say, well, why don't you just tell them to stop? Or why don't you punch them? Or why don't you, you know, like blah, blah, blah. But our caveman brains do not work like that. You know, it, when we feel threatened, we, we, our brains, basically your frontal lobe shuts off. Right. So like the advanced part of your brain, they can do complex thinking. Uh, it's, it's done. And your like little reptile brain back here is like, it's my time to shine. Uh, what do we do? What do you do? Uh, well, this worked when we were three. Let's just do that. And for some people, that's just freeze and you wait for the thing to be over. For some people, that's flight. So you might just book it. Um, fight is also one thing. If you, if you are immediately rushed to anger and you just go in swinging, even though it's a terrible idea and you know that, your reptile brain doesn't know that. Um, and then also fawning uh, or friend that the, they kind of mean the same thing. And fawning just means um, you kind of pretend again, not really like consciously, but you pretend to be like, yep, everything's great. I'm polite. Everything's nice. Don't be mad at me. Okay. Bye. You know, like you just, you become buddy, buddy with them in a way um, in hopes that whatever they're doing to you, stops or doesn't get worse or is over more quickly. And, the, and, and that also works that's a for tough one to understand. Yeah. And that's also, that works for, you know, a bystander who's interfering as well. Yeah. To, to like, to, you mean to explain maybe why they're not intervening? Or? Right. Or like, <laughs> yeah. like, you know, I think the way you described it was, you know, you got the big biker guys or whatnot. And, but you've got the one is like, you know, no, I'm good. You know, I'm not mad at you. You know, that kind of thing, kind of de-escalating the situation. And, and Yeah. And now I wouldn't say that that's the same as like that fight or flight mode, you know, like fight, flight, blah, 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 blah. you know, freeze, fawn. Those are like, uh, reptile brain is, is doing its best to protect you. It doesn't actually know what you should do, but it's doing its best. When people actually engage in like de-escalation techniques or they're talking someone down, that's that's someone that has a little bit more control in that moment. Their brain, their frontal lobe hasn't shut down and, and they're, they're doing their best to just bring down the temperature a little bit. Um, and maybe it looks similar to friend or fawn sometimes, but, but I, I really think that there's, there's less, um, uh, big thought when you're fawning and, and just trying to be like, I'm not a threat and goodbye. <laughs> you know, well, I don't know. Uh, I'm also not a fucking brain scientist, so <laughs> I'm sure I'm not describing it perfectly, but there is a reason I wrote it out in a book is so that I wouldn't have to be, uh, I wouldn't have to memorize it and answer a quiz uh, at any point because then I would get an F. <laughs> so I did the research and then I wrote it down so I don't have to remember. Exactly. It, it will, you know, it's <laughs> what Einstein said, you know, about his phone number while well, memorize something like I can just look it up. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. That's half the reason I wrote this book. I have a terrible memory, honestly. Uh, and so it was really nice to get it all down. I, I, I will literally look things up in my own book to make sure that I'm saying something correctly. So it is useful. <laughs> well, you know, one thing as an artist, especially as a front person in a band, okay, you know, you guys wield a pretty incredible amount of power from the stage. And, and we've all seen videos of different artists or whatnot where you may have to be the one to point out something that's going on in the crowd. And 
you know, I think it, it says a lot for the artists out there that, that are paying attention to, to, to the floor and they see wrongdoing going on and, and they step up versus the situation that you uh, had discussed in the past about um, an incident at the Warp Tour. Mm-hmm. But, you know, and I, I don't a part of my training sometimes is is telling people how much power they actually have, mm-hmm. like just reminding them. I think a lot of artists don't necessarily think about it like that. And for me to say, no, 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 you can do a lot because you have a PA behind you. You have volume behind you. You have lights on you. You have a microphone. Like you can do so much. Um, And I think that that's like, I've seen some people when I'm talking to them, that blows their mind a little bit, you know? Uh, But anecdotally, I was just uh, consulting with an arena about some safety things. And they told me that ever since, um, I think it was, it was Travis Scott at a festival. Oh, Astro world. Yeah. Astro world. Like, yeah. Someone got killed. Is that Mm -hmm. like, they like crushed in the crowd kind of situation. Um, Ever since then, this arena is noticing that more of the artists coming through uh, their venue uh, are willing to stop something, to say something before it becomes like a big issue. Like they're quicker to say, hey, 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 what's going on over here? Get the lights up. You know, we're security, blah, blah, blah. Um, which I think is, you know, when you're that big and you're playing arenas, it's probably a money insurance thing. Oh, yeah. Um, but also you can care at the same time. And I think everybody... It's okay to, to respond to wake-up calls. I, I, so I think Astro World is just a wake-up call to people of like, you know, you you are in the best position <laughs> to see what's going on um, when it's dark. And uh, ushers are worried about, oh, let me make sure you got the right ticket, you're in the right section. You know, every, everyone else that's working, as you know, is not getting paid very much. <laughs> they're on their feet, they're tired, mm-hmm. it might be their second job everyone's doing their best i'm sure um but you're the one that can actually see the audience the best when you're on stage so why not say with all that power well to your point too talking about the size of venues i mean smaller venues i mean let's face it we've all went to shows at smaller venues they're extremely compact you've got some situations where it may seat 1500 people and it's like a can of sardines and there's a lot that can go wrong in that pack of people. And, you know, I've been to plenty of shows that way. You know, it's, it's almost a responsibility at this point. If you see, it's the whole, if you see something, say something. And then, you know, the people on stage, you know, you've got typically most of the action is going to happen there. Well, what would you say? Like the first 10, 15 rows. Right. 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 Yeah. Where you can see. Yeah. And I think it's a matter of like, no, it's not fun to stop a song, stop a show. Um, to, to be the, the parent or whatever saying, come on guys, knock it off. But, um, the more we do that right now, we can, we can change audience culture a little bit. And the more just normal it will be when you say, Hey, everybody back up, everyone will back up and give some space. Like the more that we do it, but that's really funny that you say like 1500 for small venue. When I think small venue, I'm thinking like 50. Oh, wow. (laughs) I'm like thinking 20 to 50 capacity for a small venue. So I've, I've played a lot of different venues is what I'm getting at, Steve. Got you. Got you. <laughs> well, you got to start somewhere, right? <laughs> so, um, or, or you're going to maintain that's, I think that's what we're doing. <laughs> right. Um, well, talking about the band a little bit. Um, so what do you, I know you guys are touring. Are you currently doing the tour with Alkaline Trio and Bad Religion? Or is no, we we were able to reschedule that for the fall of last year, 2021. That's a good um, bill. That's that's oh, great. It was great. It was great. It's super weird to tour during COVID. Um, it so I, I feel like we're not touring as much as we did before COVID. We're being a little more selective, um, and and just knowing that like. The longer you stay out, the bigger your chances of getting COVID also. So mm-hmm. if you're out for too long, then you could you could get it and then have to cancel half the tour and then you're in complete debt, you know, because um, so many of the touring expenses are up front. 
Um, yes. Or, you know, sometimes a van company, like we have to rent a van. We don't own a van. Sometimes a van company is like you rented for this long. So that's what you're paying us. They, they, they should prorate it, but maybe they don't. I don't know. Um, so you just always, you know, or you buy a ton of merch in advance and then you have no one to sell it to. So, um, yeah, we, we've done a few tours. We have a couple more runs before the end of the year. Um, but to me, it feels okay that we've only, you know, been out handful, you know, five, six times, uh, in the last year. That feels okay to me. <laughs> and, and I'm assuming the band has dodged a bullet on, on COVID. Yeah. I mean, I think a couple, like, I don't want to say who, but some of us have gotten COVID, you know, over the last couple of years. Um, and there's been only one show that we had to sort of cancel a full band performance, but we were able to do it as an acoustic, um, acoustic performance. Um, and I would say it's actually been the other bands <laughs> that have, that have gotten it and had to cancel shows. And then maybe we don't get to play a show or we have to reschedule or we have to find the show because the promoter in this town well, he wanted that full bill. So if it's not the full bill, then he doesn't want it at all. Okay, well, where else can we go? You know, so we're scrambling. Like, that happened when we went on tour with Good Riddance. Um, in the spring, they got COVID and were basically, it was only like an eight or nine day tour and they were gone for like four or five days. So it's like, wow. yeah, so we barely saw them. We barely got to know them, you know, um, and we had to like just scramble and fight like our booking agent, you know, was like, can we have a show? Can we have a show? And we were working with like um, uh, another band, Teenage Halloween. They were being so helpful and trying to find shows for us together. And like, you know, we squeaked it out, but we definitely didn't make as much money as we would have uh, otherwise, uh, not only in just, do, you know, door money, show money, but also merch sales. If there's less people because it's last minute, um, then there's less merch sales. Uh, so, yeah, it's 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 complicated. And it's well, you tough. know, a lot of people, a lot of bands had a problem in the spring. You know, there were a lot of tours that got canceled. I was just totally shocked that the stadium tour actually fucking happened, to be honest with you. Yes. Yeah. I, I was like, yeah. that that's gutsy with what's going <laughs> on. Yeah, like, like that's you know the insurance company's sitting there like the meme with the dude behind the watching behind the tree rubbing his hands waiting for that to fall through. But um, so as far as like your band goes, I'm assuming you guys don't have like a big road crew or anything, right? No, 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 no. Yeah, no, so yeah. yeah, so really when the pandemic hit, you know, you're looking at basically you're just your core band. You didn't have a lot of other people to worry about. That's correct? true. There were there are a lot of other bands all their crew, you know, some of these bands, they're, they tour enough of the year that their crew are on retainer. Right. Yep. And, but that only works if the band can count on making money. And so I heard about a lot of different levels of trying to support your, your workers uh, when you're not out there making money that, that pays them. Um, you know, some people were just like, we can't, sorry, go get unemployment. You know, some, gave them what they could and told them like, get ready to get unemployment. I don't know. Um, but if there's just no income at all, uh, coming in, it's only those big giant fucking bands like Metallica or something mm -hmm. that could probably just continue to pay people for a year or two, even without any shows, you know, there's so many people that don't understand what all you guys went through. <laughs> I mean, I mean, they, they really don't. I mean, you know, for, for the average person, you know, these bands and artists, it's their entertainment. They, they don't understand the grasp of like, you know, smaller or mid tier bands, what goes into what you have to do, the things you have to do to sustain any kind of, you know, living standard and income. And I mean, let's face it, gig workers got fucked during that yeah. whole mess. Well, and that's the thing, like most musicians are gig workers and not gig as in playing the show is mm -hmm. you have to have the kind of job that you can drop to go on tour or that will let you leave all the time. So those aren't like big career money making jobs, right? So every job like that, like was gone. 
And then when it came back, it was, it's, it's, it's grocery store. I mean, thank goodness grocery stores stayed open, but people were putting their lives on the line to work at grocery stores Mm -hmm. to when restaurants were trying to open back up and deliver food and have people eating outside. Um, Those are the kinds of jobs that musicians have and you're putting your life on the line for so long. I think people would, people might say, well, not anymore though, not anymore, but the more that we learn about long COVID, oh, yeah. <laughs> maybe, maybe yes, maybe yes, they're still putting their lives on the line. Um, but yeah, the, 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 the jobs that we have so that we can play music also do not have health benefits or uh, care about our well-being or even even if you happen to have a good boss and it's a good environment, it doesn't mean there's enough money, you know, to really support anyone uh, in a meaningful way. So that plus just the mental uh, the mental mind fuck of well, all I've been doing since I was 14 years old is going out there and touring as much as possible. And now I can't. Like, I just can't. Who am I? Right. I mean, that, Who am I without that's that? That's your identity. What am I without that? There's, there's so many, even some people in my band, like their identity is touring. There's so many people that just were like, well, now what? Like, I don't even know what to do with myself, let alone like work and survival. But just who am I? I, I feel very lucky that I, I tried very early on in, in my musical life to separate my identity from performing or whatever particular band I'm in, um, because I, w- I was in a band, you know, in high school that had like the tiniest, tiniest, tiniest version of success, you know, um, Cause we like, Oh, we worked with a producer and Oh, we signed, we signed to a label. Well, everyone had their own label back in the nineties. So it wasn't that special, but you know, like, Oh, I'm 15 and this is amazing. And I'm, you know, playing good, good size shows, opening for bands and blah, blah, blah. And then we broke up and I was fucking devastated, fucking devastated. And so I feel like I worked through all that stuff back then when I was like 19 years old. And so when it happened this time, I was like, I'm actually doing okay on that front, but so many of my friends were not. And again, eventually you're still fucking dealing with a pandemic and it's making everything harder and it's hanging over your head. So I I have not come out of this unscathed at all. I just think maybe I lasted a little longer than some of my friends. Well, I mean, it's, with it being music too, I mean, when the pandemic hit, I was a manager for a guitar store in Atlanta and guess what? Nobody was shopping and it was, Oh, we're going to shut it down. Goodbye. You know? And because from the music standpoint, you know, nobody was able to go play local shows. So the people weren't coming into your store buying strings and picks and all. I mean, it was an absolute ghost town. And, you know, friends that are in the music industry that, you know, very similar. What are we going to do? I mean, the, the, there's not enough support, in my opinion, for people that are in the arts. And I think this kind of proved, the pandemic proved that. Oh, yeah. And, you know, because it, it, there are, being a musician is a real job. Okay. I mean, touring, that's, that's a real job. It's not just some fantasy. There's a lot of work that goes into it. A lot of planning, you know, as a group, you have, you you have to have each other's backs to make sure all, all of you in the group eat. I mean, this is, it's not, (laughs) it's not this fairy tale that people think it is. Yes. Yes. And you know, right. It's like, if we, we, we can't just think about those bigger bands that we like to go see in the arenas, like that's not actually the music industry in a way, <laughs> like it makes up the smallest percentage of the music industry. Um, and yeah, it is a, it's basically like really hard, tiring travel and logistics and everything you mentioned for like, a really great 30 minutes Mm -hmm. on stage. Like that part is really rewarding. There's obviously a reason 
why we do this. Um, we, we feel creative, we feel a need to express ourselves, we want to get these feelings out, we want to share it with people in a room, like, it's a beautiful thing, really. But that's such a small part of the day. You know, mm -hmm. it's such a small part of the day. And I will say, like, over the pandemic, I completely lost my creativity. Like, I could not write a lyric to save my life. I had absolutely no drive to write music at all. Even strum a guitar, just to mess around a little bit and, and see if something happened. I did not, I, I couldn't, I had no mental capacity for that. Wow. All I wanted to do, one, I was trying to survive every day, right? Seeing what I could see about how do I get money? How do I get money? How do I get money? because funds are dwindling <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and I need to eat. Um, and then at night it was, let's put something on TV. I need to escape. And that, that's all I could do. And it's kind of only been recently that we've started working on new stuff. Well, that's because, good. Yeah. Yeah. And, and really I'm the holdup. Right. Like we, we have a million riffs for a million songs. We could put out four albums tomorrow, probably with everything that we have, kind of like the ideas we have, whatever. But it's me. We're waiting on me <laughs> to write lyrics and melodies because it's just been so, so slow going, you know, like creativity. You know, there's there's a reason. It makes me think that there's a reason why. uh you know, society considers the best artist to be like all these white dudes or whatever. And it's because like, well, they had like the time <laughs> and the resources mm -hmm. and maybe they weren't all worried about, uh, you know, where their meals were coming from. And there's kind of this, this joke on, uh, I see with writers, uh, you know, on Twitter or whatever that like, oh, all these great American novels exist because those dudes had wives that did the laundry did the dishes made their meals oh here's your tea took care of the children so they didn't fucking have to so they actually had the capacity to sit down and be creative it's not because they're better at those arts right i agree with it's that a hundred percent yeah they just had the opportunity and the privilege to to lean into it yeah that's uh you're spot on I mean, when you've got somebody taking care of everything at home and you're just sitting there doodling, well, guess what? You can write a, a fucking huge ass best-selling yeah. novel easy. And you're, yeah. you're taking for granted the actual work that's going on behind you to get you there. Yeah. And so that, then that makes me think, well, what have we missed out on? Yeah, you have. Because, because we're, we're keeping people in poverty you know, children across the world <laughs> are starving, uh, environmentalism, um, like environmental refugees, you know, like there's what stories, what great art are we missing out on? Because people are just worried about survival. Yeah. And, and to your point, I mean, it's oppression. Yeah. I mean, really. And, and I feel the same way about retail workers and there's, there's this, you know, there's this joke of like, oh, well, you just work as a waiter at a restaurant until you become an actor, you know? And it's like, it's really fucking hard yes. to work a draining retail job and then still have time and the mental capacity to do your art. Like, to me, now at my age, I'm like, that was only possible in my 20s. Like, and I, so we exploit the fact that young young people when i was younger i don't know if i was naive or just had the fucking energy you know had a better back i don't know yeah <laughs> like that i just was like or just compelled i couldn't not just do my art and now i'm like well sometimes i need to relax actually <laughs> and that's okay too well yeah i mean and you know going from the, the retail standpoint i know for me i mean i've went up until recently just a dry spell where i wouldn't even pick up my damn guitar and, and, and I just didn't have the energy for it. It wasn't that, you know, I'd look over and be like, oh, I hate them. It's just like, 
I'm tired, you know, and, and yeah. like you said, you know, I'm, I'm 52, so I'm no spring chicken and, you know, work takes a lot out of you. And, you know, a lot of the stuff that we, you know, we talk about, you know, on the retail side of it, I mean, you, you've lived it, you've worked it. It's, it's, it's just abuse. I mean, it's, I mean, yeah. people don't, you know, uh, workers were essential when grocery stores were the only damn thing open and, and, you know, the Karens of the world and the Kyles of the world needed to eat. And it was, oh, oh, we're heroes and all this other stuff. But as soon as it was all over, fuck you, you're trash again. Yeah. 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 It's, it's, it's un, like, like I can't, um, I can't, it's hard for me to reconcile like who I am today with like, why did I let myself work these jobs on my feet over eight hours, tiny breaks, minimum wage. Like how, how is it that I did that? How was I physically able to do that? And why was I, why was I willing to do that? And I think, you know, I think some of it is just, I didn't go to college. Like I couldn't afford that. And I was young. So no one was going to take me seriously doing anything else. Like no one would take me seriously about like the skills I've gained in like tour managing myself, you know, mm -hmm. there's a lot of logistics, a lot of planning, a lot of managing that goes with going on tour. Right. But who would, who would believe me uh, if I'm like 24 um, and putting that on my resume. Right. So it's like, I just had to work somewhere. And those were the only places that seemed like I could, especially if I still wanted to go on tour. Right. Well, I think it's amazing now. I mean, everybody reaches a point. Fortunately, as long as I'd been in, in retail, I, I think I reached the point sooner than most um, mm -hmm. to where I'm just not doing that shit anymore. Right. I'm, I'm not I'm not going to put put up with that because the entire retail system is based on exploitation for people like the story you just gave. Who's going to. Sure, you can tour manage, but that has nothing to do with bagging groceries or stocking a shelf. So, right. you know, here we're going to put you to work. And, and we've all been conditioned from birth that you go to work and, you know, you work, you do this shitty job for shitty pay. Mm -hmm. And eventually one day you work so hard. You'll, you'll be able to retire and spend the last 10 years of your life wondering why the fuck did you waste all that time? Yeah. Do you feel good about, it seems like after the pandemic, there's kind of some stories out there that workers are less willing to put up mm -hmm. with bullshit. Yes. Like, do you find that that to be true? I do find that to be true. And I think it's amazing to see. I think that, you know, being a, being a store manager for most of my career, you know, me doing this whole thing, the podcast and whatnot, is kind of like my way of giving back because I was complicit in a lot of that oppression because that was my job. Mm -hmm. That's what I was told to do. And, mm -hmm. you know, looking back on it now, and especially the pandemic, for all the bad that it did, the workforce, it did some good. It woke yeah. people up to say, what are we doing? We deserve better. We don't have to kill ourselves because we're giving ourselves no opportunity to enjoy any of the good things of life and i i think that's true with music too i think that there's more musicians and artists that are saying basically the pandemic broke up the momentum right mm -hmm. like people were just going 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 and didn't have time to assess think about should I still be going? <laughs> Should I be working every day on my feet? Like, whatever, it's my job. Got to get through the day. And then the pandemic gave everyone a chance to reflect. Well, and I think after that, more artists are like, this music industry is unfair. I need to protect my mental health. One tour will not make or break my band, mm -hmm. which that is something that, like, I, I absolutely used to think we have to take every show offer. Because then if we say no, then they'll stop asking us. If we say no once, people will stop asking us. I really felt that way. Well, I understand like, why. That's not true. Yeah. Because they make you feel that exactly. way. Exactly. <laughs> and, and to your point about the mental health thing, you know, it really kind of pissed me off. Maybe not my style of music, but, you know, you look at Bieber canceling. You, you was it Mendez, I think he canceled. And, and they're coming out and they're saying, look, I need to take a break, you know, for my mental health. And it pisses me off that there's fans out there that are pissed off that they can't see this tour. They, they can't attach the human 
They can't separate the human yes. from the product. And yes. I don't care if you make millions of dollars as a touring artist, guess what? You still have a real life behind the scenes. You still have things that go yeah. on that, that sure, maybe you got more money or whatnot, but yeah, I think he can afford to take a tour yeah. off, which is like, you know, makes me, then I have to remind myself to be sympathetic and remember mm -hmm. he's a human being. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but you know, there's stuff that goes on behind the scenes that none of us ever know. And, and just because you bought tickets to a show, if somebody's got a crisis, Look, they need to take time for themselves. If it's legit, that's yeah. what they need to do. That's even happened to bands at our level, mm -hmm. too. Like fans, fans complaining, how dare you cancel this show? How dare you not come to my town? And it's like, we're not magic, mm -hmm. you know. And, the, so and if those same they're fans. doing that to us, of course they're doing it to those bigger artists. Yeah, those fans are going to be going to the grocery store complaining to somebody, too, that they were out of something. It's, those, it's the exact same kind of people. I mean, it really is. It's, it's, it's it feels that way. You, yeah. Like the people like that, they, they literally look at an artist like you're serving them, you know. Yeah. And sure. There's obligation. Right. There. No, it's not. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Yeah. I, I do find that interesting. Um, um, did you get any of that kind of pushback of anything you guys had to cancel? Uh, no, because the big thing that we had to cancel, we were the small band on the bill. Oh, so all all that shit went to the bigger bands. <laughs> um, there was a question. That was that, nice. Thanks, Bad Religion. Thank you. <laughs> there, there was a question that came through. Um, bucket list bands that you you would love to tour with. Oh well. For the record, the second anyone asks me a question like that, my mind goes completely blank. Uh -oh. I freeze. I freeze. I'll say that. That's my that's my trauma response. I freeze uh, in case anyone wants to freak me out and startle me. <laughs> You'll see me go like this. Um, so that's what I'm doing in my mind. I'm freezing uh, because I don't know how to answer this, but I can name some. How about that? Good. It's not definitive. No one get mad. Okay. Um, we've been lucky enough to play with the Refused. A few times, but I would love like a full on tour with them. Um, also, I loved I love touring with Bad Religion and I'd love to like tour Europe with them or something, you know, like go somewhere else. Uh, so we did the States. Let's try another country. Um, I I love my friends in anti flag. Mm -hmm. And so it's always nice to be around friends. Um, and. I also really love, uh, uh, is it, oh, I might have to look it up. Is it Amel and the Sniffers? Uh, I don't know how you pronounce that. Um, I don't know if it's Amel, Amel, Amel. Um, um, I, I'm liking them right now. Uh, you know what? Katy Perry, take us on tour. We're fun. That's like, that's what I was shoot for the moon, right? thinking, you know, why, why not do like some, have there been any offers to do like a quirky bill like that? Like you two polar opposites, like tour with Billie Eilish. There you go. Right. I know. Like I would actually really love that. I, I think we've, I think we've played with bands like that are all under the rock umbrella. Mm -hmm. So maybe it's a different kind of punk or maybe it's like more nineties indie rock or, you know, whatever. Uh, maybe they're more metal, maybe they're more pop punk, you know. So we we haven't really toured with anyone that sounds exactly like us, uh, which is awesome. But I am interested in more weird. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I think there's so many, like, 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 women are dominating pop music. Like, they're just putting out the best stuff. Um, they're the most popular pop artists. Um and I think to expose their audience to some feminist hardcore punk would actually be very, very cool of them to do. So literally, literally, can you just tell that I want to go on tour? Yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> I'm thinking, well, Anthrax, anyway, Anthrax and Public tour. Enemy made it happen. Exactly, exactly. I fucking love that. I love that so much. Right. So like um, I've been listening to Lotto who is a rapper that's out right now. And I think she's really cool. She did the like uh, big dick energy, uh, Mariah Carey uh, mashup song. Um, and, you know, Cardi B, call us up. We're here for you <laughs> anytime. Let's do it. 
Um, I'm really, I'm really shooting my shot. These, these, these artists are way out of our league, but, um, well, but I, I love the idea. Uh, the one thing you're talking about how like females are kind of like dominating the pop, you know, industry. One thing that I'm seeing in the, and as a guitar player lifelong, I am a hundred percent convinced that our next round of guitar heroes are going to be women. There, there are some fantastic. So many, yes, there's so many amazing, like, working guitar players, if you know mm-hmm. what I mean. Like, they're hired guns, they're in the band for artists that might be pop artists that have a live band. Um, you know, they're playing with Alice Cooper, they're playing with um, Beyonce, right? Like, so maybe more people are seeing them on stage. And I would love for that to transfer over into, like, actual, like, your own band like right yes. like a Joan Jett kind of like you're you're the artist you're not the hired gun right I'm hoping that I'm hoping that you're right that the next wave would be like people starting their own calls and to be fair like there's so many bands out there with women in them playing instruments mm-hmm. and it's and it's amazing there's just so many bands it's hard to keep up with and also some bands are given more attention than others and it makes it easier for bands that are maybe white dudes to get ahead. Or you're get you're correct. Or I, I fully embrace the, the, the women guitar flood because if, <laughs> if, if the, if the States can get on board with like Japan, my God, there are some phenomenal women guitar players cool. coming out of Japan. Oh, really? Cool. Yes. I mean, Almost at the point you wonder if that when they're born, they're handed a guitar at birth. They're uh, the, the kind of guitars that like, I just want to take my guitar and throw it in the, the stove or something. That you, there's no use well, in that's trying. Another, that's another bucket list. So that's not a specific band, obviously, but I we've never played Japan and I would love to. So that's a bucket list thing. If anyone If anyone's heading over there or wants to bring us over there, please let me know. That would be cool. Yeah. Very, very cool. Um, so real quick, I don't want to waste any more of your time. You've been very gracious. Um, <laughs> you. um, your secret superpower, if I'm not mistaken, hmm. is cross stitching. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'm so good at it. I'm so, it's not hard. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yes, I, that is also a thing that during the pandemic, I almost couldn't do it. You know, it's, 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 it, it became, it wasn't, it stopped being a meditative, relaxing thing and almost became stressful. Isn't that why yeah. the pandemic it was so fucking weird. It's so weird. Um, but recently, like I'll, I'll, I've started it up again. I actually have a bag. I have a bag right behind me with like a little kit. And so I can take it anywhere in the house or traveling and, and like, just do something, um, yeah, and it's it's just been it's something that before the pandemic I really enjoyed doing in the van when we would be on tour because there was no other way to stay off my phone. Oh. Like I like if I'm keeping my hands busy, then maybe I'm not watching every Netflix show in existence and I just I just wanted to be more present and see the cows going past <laughs> me, you know? Um, and it was, uh, yeah, I have very good memories of it. And I'm, and I'm just kind of only now starting to, to, to bring it back in my life. Actually. Do you make your own patterns? Um, yeah, sometimes like it's, 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 it's really easy to either, you can either be like super creative. It's kind of like music. You can be the person that like improvises and is like, you know, doing a solo, doing whatever you want. Um, or you can be like, oh, here's the riff and the structure. I'm just going to play that really well. And so you can kind of do, do whatever, do both. Um, at first I really wanted to be the improviser, um, and do all kinds of wild stuff. And, and, and that was good to sort of learn the basics of it. Um, just stitching in general, not even just cross stitching. There's different kinds of embroidery. Yep. <laughs> so we're getting really interesting now. Um, but then I was like, you know, I kind of just want to know what I'm supposed to do. Cause it's, it's more about like the meditative, like hand movement mm-hmm. 
and and then you have a finished product at the end of a van ride like that's really satisfying instead of being bored or getting car sick trying to read or like killing your mind with more tv and i say that with love because i fucking love tv so there's no judgment when i say that um i watch so much of it um which is why i thought maybe on tour that would be nice to just take a break from it sometimes right um have you ever given <laughs> any fault you give any fault to go in to, to do any more kind of theater stuff um i i would love to um it's just it's hard to be a jane of all trades and master of none mm-hmm. i just i just have so many interests and it's that thing of like, okay, but I have to pay the mortgage this month. So what do I need to do? Like, I got to think about what I need to do, not what I want to do. And again, as a gig worker, sometimes I'm having to create a paid opportunity for myself um, that wasn't there. You know, check in with people. Hey, did you want that training this month? Let's do it this month. Oh. <laughs> you know, um, that happens sometimes. So, uh, but uh, I, I am starting Basically, if anyone's watching at any point that wants me to be in anything, I love, I'm an only child. Put a camera on me, put me on a stage, happy to perform. I love that stuff. It's so fun. Like you're talking about two minutes to late night. I love working with them. Oh, that's great. Funny stuff. Yeah, doing, doing just, you know, skits, whatever. Like I really, really love acting. Um, I've just been getting my performing kicks on stage playing music for so long that I kind of got out of it. But I have recently started training to become an intimacy choreographer, which is like a fight choreographer for stage and screen, but for moments where there could be like intimacy, there could be touching, uh, there could be um, less clothing that you would wear out in public. Um, Not even all necessarily sexual, but just something that might feel intimate to the actor Mm -hmm. even and so i've been sort of re-entering theater world but not as an actor myself just as like training to become this intimacy choreographer that sounds quite interesting and challenging yeah it's it's super interesting and it's definitely something like a job that's getting more and more popular um with there's there's a show called bridgerton on netflix where the fact that like they just had really amazing sex scenes and so people wanted to talk to the intimacy choreographer about that so it got it's gotten a little popular lately lately but i think that it fits perfectly under like my whole umbrella of safety Mm -hmm. you know uh like i do bystander intervention i do safer space trainings for venues i i i consult with bands and individuals and groups i wrote this book and now I can help not only the theater be a safer space for the people walking in and not only a safer space for the actors, but now like the actors while they're on stage too, um, and be part of the show in a creative way as well. So I'm having a good time so far. Um, and it's just, uh, we'll see how it goes. You know, it, it takes a little while to make sure that you're ready, uh, because what I don't want to do is come into a situation, not really be ready, and then I make it worse. I make it weirder for people. The point is to make it less weird. Well, everything I've read from you, everything interview I've watched, uh, you know, since I came along who you were, you're pretty well put together. So there's no doubt in my mind that you're not going to be prepared. <laughs> I do my best, Steve. I do my best. I mean, you know, you're, you're, but you know, a good Southern phrase, sharp as attack. So, oh, well, as a Texan, I, I appreciate y'all. Oh, there you go. There you go. From Texas to Baltimore, Lord. Wow. Right. That's culture shock. Yeah. All righty. Yeah. So thank you once again, Shauna, uh, for being here tonight. Uh, I really do appreciate it. And I'm, once again, I'm going to say that your vocals on, the Van Halen cover Slade. I'm just going to say that. I thought that was awesome. And I thought the shirt that you wore was fantastic. I love that shirt and I find not enough opportunities to wear it where it's appropriate. Oh, I should have, I should have just asked you to wear it tonight. It'd have been okay. Yeah. (laughs) So that would have been awesome. But anyway, uh, real quick, you know, 
give us like your last little pitch where to go. Like I said, I've got all the links to all your stuff, your podcast, the whole nine yards in the video description, along with the link for the Great. book. So if there's anything you, you want to add, check that out. really buy the book and like, and subscribe to my podcast. And if you want to help me do all my silly feminist things that I love doing to keep everybody safe, support me on Patreon. Um, but on socials, I'm usually uh, at Shauna Potter. Wow or Shauna Potter official. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, ma'am. You stay safe up there. Good luck on the tour. Um, have fun at the masquerade. Yeah, I will. I will. I will. I'll give you a shout out. You'll be there in spirit. Yes. Thank you, Steve, for having All right. me. Seriously. Thank you so much, everybody. And uh, we will see you guys next time. Thank you.